Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for sticking around. Uh, I, uh, I'm very glad that you all showed up for this talk uh, today about the dangers of AI and machine learning. Um, it's not really a technical talk, so no code, I'm sorry. Um, that's for another time. But I'm going to tell you a bit about um, the state of AI and machine learning to date and uh, all the awful things that people are doing with it. Um, and I, I am Ben, you can just say Ben. Um, I work for a company called InfoFarm, who specialize in data science, machine learning, and big data. Um, so you might ask why is someone making a living out of big data and data science and machine learning telling everyone that it's dangerous. Uh, it's not because I want to tell you that you shouldn't use it, only that you should use it wisely. So before we get started, maybe let's start with some terminology. Okay, so we can speak the same language. Um, what exactly is AI? Um, and AI for me is simply um, a definition of a computer software of a, or a computer system who can uh, perform intelligent tasks that are uh, deemed possible only by humans. So things uh, from which you say, oh, I didn't know a computer could do that. That for me is AI. So performing intelligent tasks. And AI is really isn't something new. It's something that uh, actually started in, uh, in 1943 already. In 1943, there was the first description of a neural network by uh, some guys called Pitts and McCulloch. Um, and they were the first one to think about an intelligent uh, system uh, and an, an, a system that would mimic the workings of the human brain, which is really popular these days. And in 1950, uh, a guy called Alan Turing, who you, uh, I think you all know, um, published a paper about machines that think. So it's more than 60 years old, um, the concept of artificial intel intelligence. Um, and actually in 1956, people started doing AI research um, and things graduated slowly. Um, but there was ent there was enthusiasm for the field of AI up until uh, 1973, when government halted funding for the research into AI, disillusioned by the lack of progress in the field, and that's actually the start of the first AI winter. When you say first because obviously there was a second as well. Um, the first one didn't last that long. Uh, it lasted until the 1980s, until uh, people in Japan started picking AI up again and doing more, more research. But then in 1987, um, people were, were disillusioned by the lack of hardware power and the lack of progress because of that. Um, and the second AI winter started. And things uh, were really quiet in the field of AI. There was one big spike in 1997 when the Blue, the IBM supercomputer, wins a game of chess against Kasparov. But uh, it actually lasted until 2011, when Watson, again, a product from IBM, won Jeopardy and um, showed a bit of intelligence. And in the years after that, there were more and more new releases. Facebook uh, released DeepFace, uh, uh, groundbreaking facial recognition software. Um, we had a breakthrough with AlphaGo, who won Go, one of the hardest board games uh, to date. Um, and there were new and new and new achievements. Uh, and really good stuff happened. Uh, for example, in the field of image recognition, um, you can do really useful stuff with machine learning and AI. Uh, for example, in my phone, in my uh, photo library, if I type in mountains, I, s I get all the pictures of mountains automatically without me having to tag them. Um, I can detect credit card info for the lazy pe uh, person that I am. I don't have to type it in. I can just detect it from the image. You can do less useful things like uh, distincting muffins from chihuahuas. Apparently, that's the thing. And uh, it's apparently really hard for computers to do still to date. Um, seeing if a photo is a hot dog or not a hot dog, uh, but also really useful things like detecting can cancer and stuff. So there are a lot of useful cases uh, which advocate for the use of AI. But uh, obviously, with great power comes great, great responsibility. Um, so there are bad things happening as well. So let's get to the juicy stuff uh, and the main content of this talk for today. Um, AI actually is a real threat to, to our privacy. Um, and why? Mainly because of that 
uh, good facial recognition that we can achieve these days. And you might have seen the news. Um, it's it's really um, common to see, for example, in the Hong Kong protests that the government is using facial recognition to see who is pro protesting against the government. Um, it's quite a dystopian future that we're living in today. Uh, in China, people have the social credit score um, where if you do bad things in public that you uh, get deductions from your social uh, social score and you can't get a loan anymore, you can't go studying, you can't buy things anymore. Um, and they use facial recognition as well. Uh, so people trespassing a, let, a red light in, uh, in China, they get detected by cameras. And if they see you pass a red light, you get a deduction from your social, social score. Uh, but that goes awfully wrong uh, as well. There was a case of a famous businesswoman who was uh, having her picture on a bus in, uh, on a road sign and who was uh, passing the the light obviously when it was a red light for the uh, pedestrians and she got publicly shamed on a wall in a deduction of our score so even then uh, things go wrong but it's not only uh, used for um, looking at people or identifying people and not only by the government you have private companies who are working on uh, using these facial recognition features. For example, you had a Find Face, a company that used uh, photos from Vkontakte. Vkontakte is the uh, Russian Facebook. So there are a lot of people in Russia who have their, their profile pictures on Vkontakte. <laughs> so what could you do with Find Face? You could just snap a picture of someone you saw on the street and then it would uh, look through all the Vkontakte profile uh, pictures and it would, would tell you, okay, this person probably has this name. So really good for stalkers. stalkers. Um, not uh, necessarily legal everywhere, but it's possible. Um, so what you get with um, the fact that you can recognize everyone's face at any given time with relative ease is that you get closer and closer and closer to a surveillance state. And actually, it's not really hard to build this. Uh, you think, okay, you need billions of cameras and the government, ne government needs to control them all. But um, there was a study actually from the New York, New York Times who wanted to see how hard it would be to create their own uh, surveillance state. So let's have a look at that. Um, actually, what they did um, in the New York Times is they... Um, looked for public cameras somewhere and they found one uh, in uh, Bryant Park in Midtown Manhattan that was watching the street, uh, one above a restaurant and that feed was available publicly online. So what they did was they took that feed and looked into that feed for, uh, for one day and they um, fed that feed into facial recognition software from AWS. So you have uh, AWS recognition which uh, is a service that you can use to use for uh, facial recognition. So what they did is they fed that video into recognition. And what they also did was look at public profiles of companies in the neighborhood. So universities, schools, uh, public companies. And they fetched the profile pictures from people working there and fed that into the system as well. And then they had a matching algorithm where they could uh, identify people that were crossing by across the street and they could just see, okay, this is this guy. So the Find Face app, but built um, with your own software, your own um, programming skills. And that's actually something a decent developer can develop in a couple of hours time. Um, so this was the New York Times. They built this using, I think, $60 in cloud resources. Um, and yeah, this is New York and you can say, okay, I don't control cameras, so it's really hard to build this. But even if you want to build this yourself, there are tons of public cameras available. And I'm going to try to control the slide again. Tons of public cameras available, even public cameras that people have in their own homes um, and that they didn't secure or actually didn't secure very well. I'm looking for my pointer again. This is the next slide. This is the one I was looking for. So you actually have 
a service online that you can use to track cameras all over, all over the world, uh, where you can find unsecured cameras. For example, this one is just a list from uh, cameras in Antwerp. You have people in the streets, but you even have people who have cameras in their own house. It's really crazy. So if you want to build this yourself, you're really not far off from building uh, this. So keep in mind that facial recognition is dangerous and it's really easy for people to track you and tag you. Um, so how do you overcome this? Um, it's not that easy, but it is possible. And luckily, um, with a little help of machine learning, you can solve all your problems. So the answer to um, being detected by an AI is using an AI that fights that detection. And that's actually some research that people are doing at the University of Antwerp, where they are creating adversarial patches, they call. So it's actually a patch generated by a neural network um, which battles the neural network that is identifying people so that that network cannot identify the people anymore. So they created a patch, so if you wear it on a piece of cardboard, you um, won't get detected by um, recognition software. So that software cannot de detect anymore that you are a person. And there were smart people who were also de uh, designing this in <coughs> clothing, so they're uh, designing pieces of cloths. Uh, but this is still in a prototype phase and not really working. Um, and this stops automatic tagging from happening on you. Um, it does not, does not make you invisible. It's actually a disclaimer on the site. It does not physically make you invisible. It just makes you untrackable. Um, so I tried it. I tried advers adversarial patches. Um, the only downside is that they don't really work and I'll print a t-shirt. I had this really good idea that I would print out a t-shirt and I would say, you can protect yourself and I would show it on stage and would, you, you would all cheer, but it didn't work. So unfortunately, I cannot show that to you, um, but luckily, some nice people uh, from the University of uh, MIT and from IBM, October 25th, two weeks ago, um, they published a paper doing some research on printed patches on t-shirts. But they only have the paper, they don't have links to code, so I couldn't generate it uh, in the time uh, I had before this, uh, this show, but maybe for next year I can come up with a real printed t-shirt. So they're actually developing printed T's right now that uh, can overcome person detection algorithms. Um, so that's really fun to see that we can battle um, bad AI with uh, good AI by just generating new things made from AI. And that's actually um, a second danger that I see because AI is really, really good at creating fake things. Um, and you can use that for all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, you can uh, convert your pictures into something that is drawn by a famous artist. You, you maybe have seen it on the, the uh, stand of Explore group today. Um, you can do that in real time, so convert the picture and uh, make it in the, uh, the style of Van Gogh or Munch or anyone you would like. Um, what else can you generate? You can generate yourself in an older version of you. So you can uh, take a picture of, of you and see how you will age in time by looking at other people that have aged. Um, and you can do other fun stuff like uh, drawing scary cats. Um, so this is actually a demo which I can show you right here. Um, it's called Edges to Cats. And in that you can generate cat pictures from um, just drawing lines. And not only cats, um, you can also um, look at houses or generate houses. You can generate shoes, handbags, all kinds of useful stuff. Um, so maybe let's draw a scary cat together. I started the downloading of the model. It takes quite some time on the Devox Wi-Fi. So I hope that my old one still works. Um, so in like this, you can just start drawing really, really scary, freaky cats. If you're a light sleeper or you have bad dreams often, I advise you not to look at this because it's really, really awful. So I can draw. Uh, I'm really good at drawing as well. I would say it's because I'm using my touchpad, but if I would use a pen, it would be exactly the same. <laughs> so it has some legs. And if I click process, you should get scary cats. <laughs> Um, and this is all fun and maybe a bit useful here and there, but can also be scary. Think of the aging. Uh, what if your insurance company 
would um, have a picture of you when you were younger and then see how you should age over time and get a picture of you today and it sees, huh, maybe you're aging a bit faster than you should. Maybe you should raise uh, your contribution to our uh, insurance. Um, it's not legal today, but it might be possible someday. But so even there, there are dangers uh, to be seen. Um, but this is all fun and games. Um, but maybe let's have a look at this. Um, yeah, I would ask you to raise hands to see who thinks these are real pictures, but yeah, you're looking at a talk about AI and machine learning. You obviously know by now, these are not real people. These are not real pictures. These are all pictures of people's faces generated by AI. So it's actually called the 100,000 Faces Project, uh, where people have built a nifty little machine learning model um, based on people's pictures and they just have 100,000 pictures of people's faces. And you can have a look at them, it's uh, just on a Google Drive, uh, publicly available online, and I hope the wi Wi-Fi doesn't let me down, uh, because I wanted to show you some real life, well, the other one, the other examples are real, real life examples as well, but you can see that it goes wrong from time to time, to time as well. Um, so you can see in here, uh, these are all the pictures that are generated, and some are a bit weird some people have very very big foreheads especially if you have two people in the picture somewhere crazy hats is also an issue uh, with the model uh, some people have a third eye on their forehead but i don't really remember by heart if i can find one but you can see here most of them are really 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 realistic right um, so if i have a stock photo company or a company that is um, taking pictures of new clothing lines or anything uh, anything else like that, I would be really scared of this because, yeah, those people will be out of a job soon. They will be replaced by an AI. Um, so it's a good thing that we can generate new stuff. We can uh, stuff, we can do fun things with it. We can be creative, but it also poses a bit of danger. And it's not only with imagery. You can do, do text as well. Um, for example, OpenAI. They built a text generator, uh, but it was so good that it was too dangerous to release. Um, for, and there's an example in here of uh, the model. It's called a GPT-2 model. Um, that when it was asked um, or fed the text, recycling is good for the world. And no, you could not be more wrong. The machine sped back. No, it's not good for the world. And an entire text about why recycling is bad. And this is really useful if you're in the fake news business, because right now there are a bunch of people in Russia or India, and on, or I don't know where, building fake content and writing fake articles. But this can all be automated and distributed at scale. Um, so it might well be that uh, we might see future elections being influenced by fake news, not only made by humans, but by computers as well. So you can be swarmed with fake news. Um, and you can see this in action as well. Um, and I can just keep on adding to this talk because it gets outdated every time I bring it. Um, because the, I said it's too dangerous to release, but on November 5th, they released the full-sized network, so now it's apparently not dangerous enough anymore to release, uh, maybe because reality has come, uh, is even worse than uh, the fake things. But, uh, for example, I can, uh, let's say I am a reviewer of beers. I write beer reviews, so um, I type in, I really like this, I hope I'm typing, crafty new beer. Um, and if I let the network autocomplete it, I just get a reasonably good review of the beer. So you can see here, it's just generated by a neural network. I didn't do anything. I just typed in one sentence. I really like this beer and I get a positive review of this beer. If I would change the like by, I really hate this crafty new beer, then it should be that if I get a raging review. Might not be the case, but yeah, <laughs> that's the risk you get with live demos of going. But 
apparently someone really disliked the straws in another review. Um, so it's also also uh, really good for you to know that AI sometimes is really shitty as well. So you're not all of, out of a job just yet. Um, but we can generate pictures, we can generate uh, text, we can generate voice and sound too. Um, there's a service uh, from Lyrebird which lets you create your own avatar um, based on your own voice. Um, because we all know Siri and uh, Cortana or uh, other voices. But you can create one with your own voice as well. Um, so let's have a look how they do that. Um, if I can find my pointer again. So on the website you can see that they have original voices. In another voices. moment, down went Alice after it. Never once did she consider how in the world she was to get out again. So that's a real person's voice. And if you get a real person who speaks a lot, you can generate a synthetic voice based on those sentences, and that sounds like this. My voice might be generated by a computer, but I think it sounds pretty human. I don't know exactly how they made it, but I'm really impressed. Um, so it's quite realistic, right? And you can use this to um, alter things people are saying. So, for example... Um, I should probably get in shape this year. Um, if you have a woman saying this, you can just replace the get in shape with, um, for example... I should probably buy an alpaca this year. And it sounds fairly realistic. So you can let people say anything even if they haven't said it uh, before. Or maybe it's a woman who, have, who have, has spoken the text, I should probably buy an alpaca, but I don't think that it's in the common lexicon of most people. Um, so that's really useful. And obviously I tried this myself um, to generate my own voice to see how good the service worked. Um, so what I had to do is um, speak a minimum of 40 sentences. So I did 50, because it would be better. And then you can uh, create your own avatar, and it lets you say anything you want by just typing it in. So let's see how that sounds. Hello, and welcome to this talk on the dangers of AI. So a bit less realistic, but that's only after 40 sentences, so you can Im imagine if I get more training data in there, it would be better. And you can already hear that it has sort of my tone of voice, um, and, and I think you can really hear that it mimics my voice at least a little bit. So you can really um, have people say anything, and I've lost my pointer again. So um, you can type I like big words and I cannot lie. You can type in words and you can let uh, anyone say anything they want. Um, so if you combine all of this, we can generate uh, video, we can generate speech, we can generate um, voice. Um, what else can we do with that? Um, with the voices, we can... Hello and welcome to this talk on the dangers of AI. Thank you. We can, cannot get PowerPoint to work. I like big bugs and I cannot lie. <laughs> All right. So, what else can we do with that? We can um, have personal assistants call restaurants for us. They can capture what people are saying, they can talk back, and they can generate just whatever they want. So that's really useful, eh? a useful part of AI. Um, can also be fairly dangerous, obviously. Um, you have people that are tricking other people using this. Um, and by combining all of this, the fake voices, the fake video, the fake texts, um, you can get the things that we have all seen already. Um, for example, this uh, generated video of Obama. Uh, ben Carson is in the sunken place. Or, how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. This is a dangerous time. Moving forward, we need to be more vigilant with what we trust from the internet. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. 
The fun thing is, in the end of the video, they say presented by BuzzFeed, the most trusted source uh, on the internet. But <coughs> you can see it's really easy to fool people nowadays. And those uh, deep fakes. We're entering an. Come on, PowerPoint. Don't let me down. Yes. So. Everyone has seen the deep fakes. Everyone has seen that the deep fakes are used in porn movies. And obviously, if you create this technology, people are going to use it for porn. Always. If people can use anything for, for, for porn, people will use it for porn. So it's not really made for fake news nowadays. It's used for creating non-consensual porn. Um, but people are also using this uh, technology to trick companies into uh, sending them money. There was a case of uh, a uh, uh, people calling a manager, um, well, not really the manager, but the secretary of the manager using the voice of the manager, uh, which was a generated voice, saying, hey, I'm somewhere in a conference, I don't have any internet, this client needs uh, a bunch of money real quick, could you just wire transfer it? And the secretary, yeah, she heard her boss talking to her and she, she, she just did it. Um, and that's real dangerous. And obviously, uh, on the porn side, you also have people creating deep fake apps to create nude images of women in seconds. You can just um, show them a picture of a woman and it creates a naked version of that woman. And obviously that's fake because it won't be a real image of that wo woman. It's the equivalent of drawing the silly cats. Uh, you just have some edges and you put someone else's body on there, but nobody knows that. So it's good technology, but it's also really, really dangerous te technology. So use it wisely. Um, and as I already said, uh, how do we overcome this? Well, the solution to fake AI again is AI. So sorry, not even humans. We need AI to battle this. So there are um, challenges for detecting deep fakes, detecting fake images, detecting fake voice, because for us, it's really hard to see, but for a computer, it's really easy to see if something is generated or not. So there are challenges where peeping, people are building new neural networks to detect uh, things generated by other fake neural networks. Um, so neural networks in itself and how they are used is dangerous, but um, yeah, we are dangerous too. Um, because all of these models, they are, they are created by people. They are people creating new models. And most of the models even are trained on human behavior. Um, and you can see that that leads to problems as well. Um, you have a bunch of problems. Uh, for example, there was um, a crime predicting AI, which was trained on police data, but that police data was falsified and was uh, blatantly racist. So what did you get? You get, got racist AI judging people based on their race because the training data was race, uh, racially biased. You have people building things that just cannot be true. Uh, you have the faceception service, which can classify people based on how they look. And you can see if they have a high or a low IQ, if they will be a researcher, if they will be good in poker, uh, if they are a terrorist or not. But that's just your racist uncle that you're building. It's not really an AI. It's not something you can see. And it's not because you think it's possible that an AI makes that possible. It's really, it's just not something that can be done. And you can think, okay, it's the small companies, but the big companies suffer from it as well. Um, there is a famous example of uh, Taytweet, which is actually a product from Microsoft. And Microsoft thought, hey, we want to be better in machine learning. We want to be better in natural language processing, especially when it comes to slang and uh, the, the, the language that younger people are speaking, because most of the training data is of academic texts or news articles, but that's not the same language that younger people are using. So what did they, they do? They thought, oh, we can generate some new data by building a chatbot. Uh, and chatbots on Twitter, they are popular by the, by, uh, with the young people. And we let them uh, have a conversation and train the chatbot on the data is, that is fed into the chatbot. And it started off really nice with a friendly uh, day tweet that I uh, said, hey, I'm stoked to meet you. You're a very nice person. And it ended, uh, I think, 12 hours later with a racist neo-Nazi um, who hates women. Um, so people are awful too. Uh, and if you feed an AI with bad data, you will get a bad AI. 
Um, another famous example is uh, the one of Google. Um, Google has an awesome service, service Google Translate, um, but it uh, had a gender bias specifically in a Turkish language because uh, you have a pronoun in Turkey that uh, can either mean he or she. And if you translate that, then the translator has to make a guess whether it's, uh, it's talking about a man or a woman. And they use the translations of an official translators. And you could uh, see from those transcripts that translators usually used um, hard working or uh, very good or clever with male pronouns and uh, lazy and dumb with female pronouns. So they would often than not, more often than not say he's a doctor instead of she's a doctor. And then Google Translate would do the same thing. Um, they fixed it uh, eventually. But um, yeah, bias is a real thing in AIs. And just because uh, people are putting biased data into the training of the model, and then the model will be biased as well. And it's not only Google, it's not only Microsoft, it's AWS, it's IBM, everyone does it. So it's a fairly common mistake, so don't feel too bad if you do it as well. But keep in mind that you have to have balanced data. Um, Amazon had a tool to select um, candidates for coming into an interview. So they screened resumes and they looked, is this a good candidate or not? And it was trained on the resume, resumes of the people already working at Amazon, which were mainly, mainly male. So they built an AI that would favor male applicants um, before female applicants. Um, I talked about recognition um, from, uh, from AWS, but Microsoft and IBM also had um, recognition services that could recognize people in images and recognize features of people in images. And uh, apparently that worked a lot less on black people or on female people. Um, so it's not only the, the small guys, it's the big guys as well. Um, and you can already see, um, yeah, people are awful um, because people, they produce bad data and they put that data into your model and then your model will be, will be bad as well. Um, But it's not only the data you put into your model, it's also the way you build your model. There are a couple of common mistakes that uh, data scientists make when building models, um, like cherry picking, uh, picking the best model that fits their need but that doesn't generate well. Um, also, um, very likable, uh, likely to be overfitting as well, as overfitting your data or your model to your training set and um, having a model that is not usable in other contexts uh, falls causality. So uh, it's not because you have a correlation that you also have causation. Uh, there's a, a famous uh, correlation between uh, the, the temperature and the amount of pirates in the oceans. Um, so you could say if we if you have more pirates, we can battle climate change, but it's not true. Um, you have the danger of looking at summary metrics and not to your outliers, uh, sampling bias that we've all seen in the racist, uh, racist examples, um, and the infamous McNamara fallacy, which is people solely relying on data and only looking at the data and not looking at their surroundings, um, which is hard to explain to a data scientist that they shouldn't only look at the data, but also keep a broader mind and see at the simpler things in life. Um, and there's a big overview on uh, the side of Gecko board. I didn't make these myself, so uh, go check it out. There are t tons of others. Um, so what is important to know is what is the current state of AI? And how, what are the limitations of AI? What can you do with it? Um, and there's a good list of uh, a guy called Peter Voss, who published this list in 2016. It's not the entire list, but most of the things that he has said in 2016 are still true to date. And it's important that you know that uh, before you start anything with AI and that you know the limitations and that you know what you can do and cannot do. Um, so what can you do with AI or what are the downsides of AI to date? Um, to date, one important thing is that every application needs to be specifically trained. 
Um, and you can't really reuse that model, uh, those models for another context. So all of the models that you build are really good at one specific task, but usually terrible at another task. So the idea of a general ruling AI who decides things for us and creates killer robots who will kill us all, we're far away from that, luckily. But it's important to keep in mind that probably when you're using or building AI, that you will need to build multiple models to perform multiple tasks. Um, training models still require, require large amounts of handcrafted structured training data. Um, that's the premise of machine learning and big data as well. People say, hey, you can do everything with, uh, with it. You can throw unstructured data at it, uh, images, text, but it usually boils down to creating order in the images or in the text and training on that. Um, you also, in general, need to have uh, labeled data. Um, you do have unsupervised machine learning models, but usually machine learning, it still learns by examples. So you have to feed it in with examples and tell it what the good things are, the bad things are, and machine learning models, they learn from that. Um, and learning things, they take quite a long time. Um, they're accelerated quite a bit by using GPU in a lot of cases, but still it's a lengthy process. Um, Especially true for deep learning is um, those systems are very hard to debug. It's really a black box in which you don't really know what is happening until you see it. So it's very hard to see how you can train your model, improve your model. Um, that's also why companies like Google uh, and IBM release things to public that appear not to be that good or appear to have some bias. The only way to see that is by testing it, really. You can't really see that beforehand. Um, I've already talked about correlation and causation. Um, natural language processing is still a problem um, in English, but especially in languages other than English, Dutch, it's really hard to do. Uh, you can grasp some simple context, but understanding a full text and uh, relations in between the text is still is really, really, really hard. Um, and it's not well suited for a high level symbolic reasoning or planning. Um, AIs usually are not that creative um, and not in the sense that they can create artworks, but usually they can't think out of a box. They are really narrow in what they can do. Um, and you need to be aware of that uh, because everyone telling you otherwise and promising you that they can do things that are on that list, um, they're probably lying or they invented something and are going to make billions of money uh, of dollars uh, really, really soon. So, what can you do? How can you protect yourself? How can you be sure that you won't make the same mistakes as other people do? Um, the first thing you need to do is to get informed. And you're already doing well by being in this talk. Uh, you need to know what an AI can do, you need to know what an AI cannot do, and you need to learn by the mistakes from others. So you're already doing very well by just looking at these things. Um, don't only look at the bright side, look at the downside as well. Uh, so you can know which problems to tackle. Another really, really important one is um, if you're building models, it's a specific skill set. I'm a, I'm a a software developer myself. I'm not a data scientist. Um, and you can see that it's really, really a different breed. It's uh, a hard skill set to master. It's really easy to develop a machine learning model. Everyone can do that. It just requires a couple of lines of Python code. But what is really hard to do is to understand that model and to understand why the outcome of your model is what it is. It's also really hard to um, pick the right model based on your use case, uh, but also based on the data that you have. Some models require normalized data, some models require, uh, don't require mo uh, normalized data, some models work better with empty values, some, uh, some others don't. And it really requires, requires an expert to see which model is fitted in which case and to see how a model performs in practice. Um, and that's not a skill everyone can master. Um, it's, it's a bit like the equivalent of your project manager or your, uh, your boss trying to code again. Um, 
they might think they're really good at it, but they don't know all the ins and outs. The uh, same goes for training machine learning models. So let the experts do their thing. And also good things take time. I often see people coming at me telling, hey, I need this fancy model and I want to detect things from imagery and you have two weeks to put something in place and then we go bring it live. It's possible you can build a prototype in two weeks, but you can never build a fully fledged system with all in and outs and all outliers in a couple of weeks time. So if you want to do things right and do things well, take your time, do some iterations, take time for testing, and then re release it in the public. Um, a good thing to have different views and different opinions uh, and overcome racial bias is by having a mixed team. And this is something that works really well and that's something that we want to um, use at InfoForm as well. We have men, we have m women, we have people of different ethnicity and that works really well because people look at problems in a different way um, and it can go for f uh, to really stupid things. We build a model um, that could detect uh, clothing that people are wearing and that um, could propose other similar pieces of clothing um, and having women in the team for that is really, really, really useful. For one, for labeling the data, because for men you have uh, a sweater, a blouse, uh, um, a sweater, a t-shirt, and that's maybe it, but for, but for women, you have 20, 30, 40 categories of clothing that I didn't know of. Um, so for that, it's really useful, but also for testing it, um, for, for having a different view, a different opinion. So have a mixed team. Uh, it's really useful. And the last thing that I really want to tell to you guys if you want to start building AI um, is the premise that Google actually used um, but ditched a couple of year, years ago uh, because they wanted to use everyone's data and know everything about people is don't be evil. Um, for everything that you do, keep in mind, um, is the thing that I'm doing, is it a good thing? Is it useful? Um, it's not because you can develop something that you should. It's not because you can release things in the public that you should. Um, so be careful in what you do and, and think before you uh, do anything. Um, that's all I had for today. Um, so I hope I gave you a bit of a view or, or an overview of uh, what you can do with AI and definitely what you cannot do with AI. Um, so my message to you definitely is not stop doing this, stop AI, all wear a tinfoil hat, start wearing uh, really, really ugly t-shirts so you cannot be detected. Um, that's not the case, but just be vigilant and take care when you're building stuff. Okay, so thank you very much.